You're listening to the Zero to Somewhere podcast with Nick Palmashano and Albert So. Welcome back. Another episode of Zero to Somewhere. Another week is now passed. I don't even know what day it is. Today it is September 16th or 17th. I have no idea. Okay. I know. Life has become a blur for me. No. It's the 17th. The 17th of September. And the reason why it's been a blur, we hinted at it in our last episode, but now another week has passed. Save Our Allies was an organization or is an organization. Mm-hmm. You were in Afghanistan. Now, this mm-hmm. episode, you know, like we said before in last week, we're not going to talk too much about Save Our Allies because it is a little off subject. Uh, but of course, we encourage everyone to go check out saveourallies.org to learn a little bit more about the mission at hand. But on the business side, you have been in Washington yep. right now helping Save Our Allies kind of organize. So I think that's part of Diesel Jack because you, we talked about last week how you were gone for 10 days on this mission and then you were now gone for another uh, three days. But yeah. this one's on business. Give our audience a little idea of what's going on behind the scenes of Save Our Allies, how that's going to start to organize itself. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that happened in Afghanistan is you had a ton of different veteran groups, all with different capabilities that basically rushed to solve the problem. Yep. Like, hey, you know, there are people that need to get out. Um, you know, our effort was the biggest, you know, because we had, you know, we had a partner in the country of UAE. We had military airframes from UAE. We had three airframes from, uh, from, uh, that we got from Glenn Beck. Uh, so we had five airframes. The, the, the radio personality, TV yeah. personality, Glenn Beck. Yeah. He just has a plane. He's we, like- we, we called him up. Uh, Chad has a relationship with him, called cool. him up and asked if uh, his Nazarene fund could help. And Very they gave cool. us three planes. So we had five airframes running when everyone else had essentially nothing. Mm. Um, and so because of that, we were able to get 12,000 people out of the country, which was 10.2% of everyone that got evacuated. Um, probably the next largest group after we were task force six, eight, the next largest group was uh, task force pineapple. Yep. They, they got about five to 700 people uh, through the gates, and then they left on either government birds or our birds. Um, and then there were a ton of small efforts where people got anywhere between 30 and 50 people out, and they were using you know, helicopters or they were walking people out of country. Um, and so uh, what, we, what, what the mission was for me this week is to meet with DOD and, and the State Department and make sure that, you know, one, not nobody gets arrested yep. <laughs> <laughs> because we did a lot of crazy things uh, that everybody kind of said, yeah, this is fine right now. And so the good news is it doesn't look like the State Department's going to arrest any of us. So I'm happy about that. Um, but the other piece is we want to consolidate as many of these efforts under one umbrella. It doesn't have to, they don't have to join Save Our Allies, but, um, you know, sharing information, sharing resources, because we have airframes, you know, can we, if, if Operation Polaris and Operation uh, uh, Pineapple have people that are in the same area that need to get out and we have people in the same area that need to get out. How about instead of three people trying to find an airframe, we j- everybody just uses ours. Yeah. We fill it and then the people donating money are happy that, you know, hey, we spent a hundred grand and got 400 people out as opposed to we spent, you know, a hundred grand and got 40 people out. Yeah. And so that, that was the goal of this week. And for the most part, um, uh, it was it was good. Usually in in the veteran space, especially veteran nonprofits, there's a lot of ego involved. You know, there's still some of those guys, but for the most part, everybody was like, "This sounds great." Um, and so some organizations came, uh, joined us immediately, and said, "Like, we don't want to run nonprofits. Other organizations want to maintain their own nonprofits, but want to work with us and use our resources." And so, um, so we've essentially stood up this very yeah. significant nonprofit in the matter of really two weeks. Yep. And uh, then on the, on the business side, yep. we did lend our team to create some creative to help get this message across. Yep. I know that you guys got a little bit criticized. Like, you know, there's a lot of criticism that I think happens to nonprofits. Like, why do you market? You know, because yeah. nonprofits do end up buying ads. We've all seen 
the sad puppy dog commercials, ASPCA at Christmas, <laughs> you know, but the reality is if you don't tell your story, it will never be heard. And that's just how it goes. And so we may, we were, we obviously you're now part of two organizations at, at the time to save our allies. You're just a helper, mm -hmm. right? Just a person on the ground. Diesel Jack said, Hey, let's, let's put together something. So people know that this is happening because if you're not aware, there is no chance to earn a donation because no one will know. This will just go completely unnoticed. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we're as a business starting to think that we need to probably lend our talent more towards businesses that do good. Uh, yeah, we haven't solidified that, but like we have a this burning desire, I think, to be a business that gives to good, like focusing on helping businesses that are attempting to help humanity in some way. Yeah. So, so two two things. Um, you know, the combination, so first with Save Our Allies, the combination of uh, the content that we've created for Save Our Allies and the messaging that, you know, Chad Robichaud, Tim Kennedy, Sarah, Sarah Verardo, and, and we have put out on our own personal channels um, in a very short time has raised over $2 million. Yeah. So the answer to why do uh, why do uh, nonprofits create marketing materials? Yeah, why make a video? It, why have Tim... Well, why Tim tell has a platform, story. right? Yeah, Tim gets crap. Yeah, uh, Tim gets a lot of crap for oh, why are you posting pictures of yourself, you know, in Afghanistan, standing next to Nick or sleep or whatever? Here's why: uh, because every time that you you fly a, a plane that can carry 600 people, you're spending 300 to 400 thousand dollars, and That's we would right. like to keep doing that. We would like to keep getting people out, and so if we spend, uh, you know, a small amount of money to make content to put content out there in order to raise money, let people know what the mission is, get help, get other organizations involved. One of the big things that happened this week is 17 different nonprofits that already exist that already are, are winning organizations yep. Yep. have come on board. I mean, they're, you know, they don't, they're not working for Save Our Allies. They're working with Save Our Allies because they have extensive skills in areas like education, um, you know, building businesses, you know, teaching languages, like these are all things that like we, you know, these people need to be successful. And so that's why you market. Uh, it's just dumb to me that anybody would think that like an organization shouldn't market. It's impossible to succeed without telling your story. I do. It's just, it's not possible. I don't know any business that, or I guess the only business that does succeed is Sriracha because so many people tell the story for them. <laughs> I've heard that their marketing budget zero. I've also heard Tesla's marketing budget zero, but they did lend their car to be thrown out of an airplane once. Yep. But it's pretty tough outside. Of, but then Elon Musk's also yeah. always on TV. So he yeah. gets free advertising. Elon so. Musk is their marketing. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, to the second part, and this is a good lead in and to, uh, to introducing uh, Doc Simpson. Um, Albert and I were sitting in the room and we were, you know, as businesses grow, you start asking yourself, why, you know, what are we good at and what are we not good at? Yeah. And every time we've had a customer where, you know, it's not even that we don't feel like we're doing a good job, but we just feel lukewarm about how things are going or the relationship or whatever, um, versus getting excited about the direction of something. It's always come down to what is that organization trying to do? And in the middle of our conversation, like figuring out why are we really good with some customers and why do we just feel okay about other customers, Albert just said, you know, I just think we're a company that has to work with people that are trying to do good. And he said that, and it was like, I hate to use consulting phrases, but like- <laughs> There it, was synergy, it, man. It was that there aha was, moment. There was such synergy, it, you know? <laughs> between uh, our team members. <laughs> yeah, no, but we both looked at each other and it was like, yeah, that that's fucking it, you know? Um, and it's not about it being a nonprofit, but like, you know, companies that are trying to do the right thing, make a good product, take care of their customers, help improve their customers' lives. It's just solve, an easy story to solve tell. Solve a real problem. Yeah. Um, we joked about Patagonia 1% for the planet and how people, not, we were, Doc, you just kind of got, you were talking about people that always come out of the woodworks giving you shit, but like people are like, ah, Patagonia's a multi-billion dollar company. Why are they only giving 1%? It's like, first of all, 
<laughs> like, like who cares how much they're giving they're giving right and yep. yes one percent of their sales is pretty substantial like that's that's, a, that's not nothing and, that's a huge amount of and money. if you'd like to top them i encourage you to do so <laughs> you know what i'm saying like so go ahead and build yourself a business and give away two percent ten percent whatever that number is so so leading into that we've got doc simpson uh on today doc mike simpson and um uh, one of my favorite uh, phrases, and I'll probably uh, butcher it, but uh, Doc Simpson is a guy that is uh, like the white version of that that <laughs> Navy SEAL doctor astronaut. You know, he keeps he's the, he he's, keeps he's, coming he's the up. White Johnny Kim. Yeah, it's like lower level <laughs> because, because, because because he's a white guy. If it was an Asian guy, you'd have to up it. But like no, but actually the actually the white version of that guy is Drew Morgan. Yeah, oh. who, yeah, he was my he was my my Who's West, already been into space. <laughs> he he was my West Point classmate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's another guy that makes you feel bad about yourself. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so so Mike first was an Army Ranger. Army Ranger. So he, and then was like, you know what? I think I want to be a doctor. Mm. Becomes, Easy transition, right? Becomes a doctor. Oh. Then he becomes a film star, and he's on the <laughs> show. He's on the show Hunting Hitler. Okay. And now he has released his own line of supplements for old dudes. Oh, I'm a qualified customer. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you missed. No, I, I had to, <laughs> also in between there, I had three special forces MOSs as well. Yeah. Well, so you sh you would do a better job of, of, of talking about yourself. <laughs> yeah. But but no, I you know I you you have lived like a thousand lives in your uh you know in your fifty five years. I just found out because I thought yeah. I thought you were like fifty. You know, but you you know you've got like five extra years. Yeah, but, five but, extra ones. But you and I have known each other for a while uh, through Tim through some other things, um, and this this podcast is all about starting something in the journey from zero to somewhere. And you've had that journey like a thousand times. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> so, so for, you know, talk about, you know, give me, give us the, the, the two cent journey in your life, but yeah. like, but focusing on why, why now? do you always yeah. start new crazy shit? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's short man complex. I mean, it's, I I've been, hey, I understand that I've been compensating, <laughs> you know, for, for years it's, uh, you know, I, it, it signing up and getting a ranger contract at a high school was really all about, Hey, I, I just, I want to challenge. I, I want to be able to do something that I can say, uh, very, very few people can do can accomplish. And I want to be part of something larger than myself. And then, uh, you know, that carried, carried over when I, when I decided to go to the, uh, go to the Q course and go, go SF and become an 18 Charlie. And then seeing as an 18 Charlie, seeing that the, the medic was the smartest guy on the team. And I'm like, wow, they're the smartest guy in the team. And I get, I get wooden blocks and say, they say, here's your demo. And I get wooden blocks to carry in my rucksack they got real sick people and real injuries like every day. So they're like really doing their job every day. So Mike, maybe tell people that might not know uh, what uh -huh. an eight, 18 Charlie oh, is, you know, right. like, so, what, what? Yeah. So an 18 Charlie is a special forces uh, engineer. Sergeant is the technical name. Most, most 18 Charlies refer to themselves as a demolition Sergeant. They don't like to talk about the building aspect. They don't want to talk <laughs> about the blowing shit up aspect of it because it's more fun. Um, and that was my first job uh, in special forces. That's what I initially graduated the Q course as, and then decided to become a medic and went to medic training. Um, and then that was extremely challenging. And I liked that. And I was like, what else can I do in medicine? So I wanted to go to PA school. The army told me, no, they said I was too old. So I went to medical school and, uh, and did that went to emergency medicine residency, because as you guys can tell, I don't have a really long attention span. So the <laughs> idea of that same diabetic who's not compliant with their meds constantly coming back to me and us having the same conversation did not appeal to me. So <laughs> I wanted to work in, in emergency medicine where, you know, my relationships can be like they've been in my life very brief and we just never <laughs> fucking talk again. Right? <laughs> and, and if and if I see you in HEB, we just pretend like we don't know each other. Um so uh, EM really appealed to me. Plus that was, in my opinion, that was the best way to get back to the soft community and, uh, and take care of the people that really needed it at the tip of the spear, which is, is what I did for the latter part of my career. Uh, six years in the JMAO, 
um, deploying five times uh, with them in support uh, of the SMEs. And, and explain p- to people yeah. what that is. Yeah. So the JMA, and I can actually talk about this now because it's it's recently become o- open source. Awesome. Is a, it, it's called the Joint Medical Augmentation Unit. So it's a part of JSOC. And what it is, is it's a, it is a, uh, a high level medical unit mm. that when uh, all, all of the units that they make movies and write books about are moving around the battle space, doing really cool stuff at night, going to kill people, we are their direct medical support. Wow. So, so, so that for so, everyone that doesn't know, that puts you where, right? That puts you right in danger as well. Is that accurate? Yeah. So, I mean, typically it's, uh, and I talk about this in the, in the first chapter of my book, I can, I, I've probably been uh, as far or farther forward than any other physician uh, in GWAT. So, wow. And his tagline in life is, uh, don't piss me off because if you do, I'll kill you, bring you back to life, and then kill you again. <laughs> Which is a lot of work, but in some cases, it would be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so, you know, then you end up on TV, very popular show. Yeah. How'd that happen? Yeah. So that, that was kind of, that was of course through our mutual friend, Tim, that, um, Tim and I had, uh, we had like one degree of separation. We like knew all of the same people, but since we were different in group as different generations, we'd never worked together, um, in group. Um, I actually did meet him. I think one time, uh, at team rock, uh, training at team rock in Fayetteville oh, okay. when I, when I went back and was assigned to the Mao, but, um, somebody ended up passing, my number to Tim or Tim's number to me. And it was, it was actually because uh, when I was chief of emergency medicine at Darnell, there was a guy who had applied to residency and he was a, he was a former 18 alpha special forces officer. You see how we just slipped that in there? Yeah. You know, back just low, was, low key. Back when I was in charge <laughs> yeah. of the whole operation. That, and you don't, yeah, you don't want those. That was my dark times. You really don't want to hear about that. Cause that was basically the epitome of being an admin pug, but <laughs> We had a guy applying to residency and I wanted to vet him. Like I knew, I knew it was, his resume was legit, right? He was, he was an SF guy, but I wanted to be like, you know, like, what, you know, what type of guy is this guy? And, uh, and Tim and I put feelers out and, uh, somebody said, Hey, I know that Tim knows that guy. So I'm going to hook you up with Tim. And that's how we ended up like being in contact with one another. Then of course, Tim did the first season of hunting Hitler. And he posted something on his social media, not on his public social media, but on his private social media you know, that where he has the real friends that he actually talks to, um, <laughs> you know, Hey, this is, uh, we're looking for somebody with the following qualifications. And, uh, I sent him a text and I said, yeah, I meet all those qualifications. What's up. And he said, uh, send me a resume and uh, I'll forward it to the network, which he did. And, uh, I was still on active duty. I was, I was winding down to retirement, but I actually, uh, I shot all, everything you see that I shot in the, in season two, I was on, uh, either I was on leave right before getting my DD two fourteen, and then ultimately on terminal leave for all the stuff in South America. Um, when I shot that. So, uh, that was the way that I kind of lucked into that is, you know, Tim put in a really good word for me. The production company wanted me right away. Um, the network actually did not want me there. Um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but they wanted a younger, taller, better looking Mike Simpson. <laughs> so, <laughs> dang. Yeah. Dang. And I kept telling them, I don't think that's out there. <laughs> they wouldn't yeah. listen. Yeah. And all, wait, wait, wait those guys don't wait have to work this hard. Yeah. You oh, well, me, ultimately, they actually in- ended up giving the role to a seal. And then immediately after they gave him the role, he had like a family emergency and couldn't do it. So they came back to me. And wait, wait, like, so you were the plan B? You were plan I B? I was totally the plan B. <laughs> I was totally the plan B. Oh, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, people love oh, They're all narcissists show. over there in any way. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares about Hollywood? They're all narcissists. Yeah. Man. They don't people care about love- us. <laughs> people loved you on that show. And, and you were part of that. That was a wild trip to yeah. South, South America from it was every, a, what I've It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. And I was supposed to, I originally got signed to only do three episodes and I ended up doing five in, in season two. And then, uh, I don't know how many, eight, I think in, in season three. So, so, so once they got a taste of the Simpson, they were unwilling to relinquish it. Yeah. Well, what's it? They're like, Hey, this guy can fucking, this guy can sling down some bullshit. So we, we need to keep him on camera. <laughs> So, cause it's all, it's all about, that's the thing is it's all about, you know, when it comes to docu reality, it's, uh, 
how much of it is docu, how much of it is reality, how much of it is Hollywood. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all about, you know, keeping the audience engaged. So, you know, if, if you got somebody up there that just can't keep the audience interested. Yeah. And I think the reason I, I was kind of able to do that is, is I got lucky is I got, I got teamed up with James Holland, who's this world renowned historian. So I'm asking him legitimate questions that I really want to know. And I, yeah. I kind of feel like those were the questions that people at home wanted answered because they were kind of geeking out on James Holland too. So I, I think me being kind of the, uh, uh, the conduit for the, you know, for the, for the people that were sitting at home watching it. I think, I think that was pretty helpful. Yeah. Tim, Tim felt, uh, Tim Kennedy felt really good about hunting Hitler. He said, it, uh, you guys, you guys weren't asked to do as much cheesy shit as, uh, was required on, on a lot of shows. Like I, I have done exactly one mm -hmm. episode of, uh, reality TV when mm -hmm. Ricky, Sh when Ricky Schroeder did, uh, that thing, uh, where, where you spent like a, a week with, uh, you, a week with an MOS in the military and then a week with somebody that was in that MOS. Uh huh. And I was the guy that the, uh, the 11 series kid spent a week with, and it was at like one of Tim's fights. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, and I don't know. Did I, have I talked about this on the show before? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Um, if I if I did to yeah, anyone yeah. listening, yeah, I, yeah, I don't even know if you told me. You might have told me, but I would just blur so it. So you'll appreciate this, Mike. <laughs> I am at the time, like I don't even know if I'm if I'm belted in jujitsu. Um, mm -hmm. I've I've you know I had been rolling for years. I've rolled since '87, starting in judo. But like I am not a jujitsu guy as much as I am like a catch wrestler. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I get asked by the crew to, to show, uh, like to teach this kid jujitsu and the location that they choose, um, is, packing is owned by a <laughs> nine is owned by a nine time Brazilian world champion. And this is, and everyone is using <laughs> <laughs> this bef uh, this gym as their warm up facility before Tim's strike force fight. Nice. So it, it is a who's who of elite athletes. Mm -hmm. Like and the know, cameras are on you. Tyron Woodley is there. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'm totally blanking on his name right now. The guy that uh, uh, the, uh, God he he was the uh, lightweight heavyweight champ and the heavyweight champ in the UFC, but he lost to John Jones twice. Why am I DC? Blanking? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Corm Daniel Dece Cormier. Cormier is there. Yeah. Um, every, and, and because the cameras are rolling, everyone just stops training and they just mm -hmm. watch me teach this kid. What an asshole. Basic jujitsu. <laughs> and, and I, I just did uh, modern army combatives drill <clears throat> one. There you and, go. <laughs> and hope for the, and hope for the best. Right. And at the end of the whole thing, Jay Glazer's like, Hey, good job, man. I was like, Oh, thank, <laughs> thank God. Thank God. That was a nightmare. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, um, at the end, the kid's like, why should I join the military? And I'm like, I can't tell you to do that. I gave this phenomenal officer speech and I felt really good about myself. Mm -hmm. And then the, and then the producer goes, that was amazing. And I'm like, oh, cool. He's like, all right, we're going to move you to this sexier location with the sun in the background. And I need you to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you fucking hate that? <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, you could have just listened to the game tape. They recorded it. You could have listened to it over yeah. and over again in like, uh, until it was rote memory. Yeah. That was that's the, that's the biggest thing that I disliked about uh, about doing television. It's like, oh, okay, that was great. We're gonna need you to do it again. <laughs> or that that was that was great, but we were getting glare off the map, so we're gonna need you to do it again. <laughs> now, okay, point at the map and just pretend like you're talking about something. Like you know, all yeah. this. Okay, we're shooting we're shooting B roll. Can I get you? Get, okay, get back in the car. Get out of the car. Now we're gonna do it with the drone. Get back in the car. Get back out of the car. Yep. Yeah. Before yeah. starting at Diesel Jack, I, I, I just assumed making television, making movies, making whatever was a lot easier than it actually yeah. is. Uh, I've now that I've been on set, I'm like you. Yeah. I don't like doing things twice. So like, and that's why I tell Hollywood he's the world's greatest uh, cameraman because every take is perfect perfection. Yeah. <laughs> One take. Let's move on. Next. I, I gotta say, so I did. Uh, I did a show that uh, that. Uh, it, didn't get as much airplay as hunting Hitler. It's on Amazon. It's called Normandy 44 in the battle for France. I did that with James Holland and we did it with bright button productions out of the UK and they only shoot everything once. Wow. wow. They literally only shoot everything 
one time. They're like, we want it to be fresh. We want it to be real. We either get it or we don't get it. And there wow. was only one time we shot. It, it took we shot in uh, like nine days. We shot what it would have taken uh, anybody out of L.A. probably a month and a half to shoot. Oh, because yeah. we, we literally packed up, drove to a shooting location, jumped out, started shooting, jumped back in the car. Like that's all we did all day long. And uh, there was only kind of one people. time in that whole shoot where James was was uh, explaining something to me. And I, I came up with this. It, it kind of sparked uh, this kind of parable in my mind as to, oh, well, that's that's kind of like this. It's and if you if you watch the documentary, I talk about uh, it's I talk about a farmer finds a rock in his field and he's trying to get it out with the shovel. And what he doesn't know it's an, is it's an entire boulder and he's just going to break his shovel. Right. And I gave I I. I broke it down and I talked about it and I'm like, so that was what the German army was like beating itself against our forces. And we got back in the car to leave. And the director told me, he goes, you know, I didn't have your face in frame. That's the only time I wanted you to repeat it. But he said, the way you said it was so good. I know it would have sounded fake if I had you do it again. He goes, so we're just not even going to worry about what the visual is. We're just because we got the audio for that. And that was such, I, I will, I will go tomorrow to go do a, a docu reality thing with anybody from the UK that, that shoots in that kind of guerrilla style, just because it's, it, it doesn't wear you down. Even though we were working actually longer days, uh, mm. every morning, we, we never stayed in the same hotel twice in France. So every morning you were downstairs at six o'clock with all your bags, and then you'd eat real quick, get mic'd up and jump in the car. And that was every day. And I had Denise with me. So she's like, and she's going, is this what it's always like when you shoot? I'm like, this is exactly what it's like every time. There's not a free moment. <laughs> I'm exhausted 24 <laughs> seven. So, I, fa- I found, and I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of Hollywood experience, but I found that uh, dudes from the UK mm-hmm. are way more normal than the Hollywood dudes from the US. Right. Like, yeah. I, 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 what like do you mean? They, they don't, well, they don't have the same egos. Mm. Like, it's almost like it's a UK thing to not be like, uh, like really full of yourself. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, that, I don't know. That, I've, not, I've not met enough British guy people to, to know. You know what, you know what else I think it is, Nick, is I think it also has to do with layers of bureaucracy. And yeah. because, because I don't know how many times I heard this in doing hunting Hitler, right? They'd say, okay, yeah, that was good, but let's get one where we do this in case in editing, they want to come at it from a different, and yep. I'm like, I'm like, why don't we decide which way the story gets driven here? And they're like, well, you know, they, they might come up with another idea. So let's, <laughs> so uh, that's why you'll notice if you, if you go back and you, and you watch Hunting Hitler, you'll, you'll notice that when, like if we're interviewing somebody, yep, we never say in there. So yesterday I was interviewing this other guy and he sent me over here to talk to you. Like we never say that. Cause they're like, Oh, cause we might decide that guy you talked to yesterday. We might decide that footage sucks. So we're going to cut it out. Yeah. Mm, yeah right. Yeah. Or something like that. So you can never reference. And it's like, Oh, we might decide to put this before this, you know, yeah. you know, that type of thing. So, th- uh, so, so thinking about starting in that world, if you were going to mm-hmm. give somebody advice about starting in that world, yeah. What would you tell them? Where, where, what do you, uh, what, do they, what do they need to do? Yeah. It's uh, number one, it's going to be more work than you think it is. Okay. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I would say, I mean, because docu people and people forget this, right? So reality shows and docu reality shows, these, these all originated because of that writer strike we had years ago, right? That, mm. That's what kind of got the momentum behind all of these. But I would say if, if you want to go into television, uh, or, you know, whatever, you know, film, whatever it is, my advice would be either do documentary or do strictly scripted fake stuff. Really? Don't do docu-reality. Because oh, okay. The pro- okay. Yeah, because yeah. docu-reality, in my opinion, is the worst of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> and, he- and here's why, right? Is, yep. is I would go into interviews in Hunting Hitler, and they're like, okay, so our preliminary reports of what this individual has said before or what they said in phone conversations is this, this, and this. So what we're hoping to get out of this interview is, you know, were they here at this time? Did they see this person? Blah, 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 blah. But it's, 
it's not, it's not scripted. I mean, it's a real interview. So you go in there and it's like, I know what we're hoping they say. And the director knows what we're hoping they say, but they don't know. So they might totally, especially working through a translator, they might totally misunderstand the question. Yeah. So it gets really exhaustive, you know, you, cause you can't go, all right, stop the camera. Look, did you, or did you not fucking say in a people magazine <laughs> interview 10 years ago, X, Y, and Z. And actually at one point I did call a guy out like that off camera is cause he had done a magazine interview and he goes, yeah, but I don't remember what I said. So go read the magazine. And I was like, okay, fuck you. We're done. Um, but it's it, like I say, it's the worst of both worlds. Cause you, you don't have a script, but you have like, okay, this is, this, you, this is what we're hoping to get out of you this. Have, you have an intent. Yeah. Right? yeah. 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 And, and you'll beat that dead horse, right? You'll, you'll beat that. It's like, you know, you might figure out, there was one case where I figured out like five minutes into interviewing somebody, we're going to get nothing. This, this person either totally misremembered everything or it totally misrepresented themselves mm. and we're not going to get anything we want. And they're yep. like, well, we're scheduled to be here for two hours. Keep them talking for two hours. Even if we only get like some little minuscule soundbite. So now you're like, you know, in your, in your mind, you've kind of already checked out. But you're, but you have to stay there and just keep. Yeah, but you're still yeah. like, you're still basically, you know, yeah. interrogating them. And it's, and it, towards the end of the show, honestly, it kind of, a lot of it kind of felt like field interrogation. Um, you know, especially <laughs> you know when I'm in when I'm in Chile and I'm talking to these third generation Chileans, but 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 if you did their if you did their twenty three and me right, they're pure blooded Germans, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I'm trying, and they. Now that the cameras are rolling, they don't really want to say the things that they said in emails yeah. because they're realizing how it's yeah. going to look. Yeah. And I'm like, you're I'm like, like beating, so, beating them into a corner. And that like, was, and what, like, what sucks are, is, what's are you that? from, are you of German descent? We are Brazilian, <laughs> you know? We are Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Based on but these it, interactions, it sounds like you had, did they, did the production company give you a lot of authority? Cause it sounds like you were able to talk to these people, you know, behind the scenes, like, Hey, I yeah. need you to do this. The, the more that it progressed, the, the kind of the more we got, it was, a, so when I came in, Tim already had that. Cause he'd already, he'd already done one season with him and he kind of knew how things worked. What, what kind of hampered me a little bit is initially I wasn't working with Tim, so I didn't have his brain to pick. Yeah. Right. And, and this was, and it was, it was new to me and it was new to James, both of us. Right. So it was a little bit of a struggle, uh, kind of figuring out, kind of finding my pace, finding my voice on screen. Um, but by the time, we, by the time we were two or three days in, in Spain, I kind of figured out, I'm like, okay, this, this is how it works. Right. And, and I'm like, just give me notes, get, you know, give, give me a synopsis of what this person is on. Cause nobody that we interviewed was somebody who wasn't kind of on record as saying something. You know, I saw a plane crash or my, my dad worked at this lighthouse when, you know, Goebbels or whoever ever came to, uh, to inspect it. So I'm like, you know, Hey, give me, give me the synopsis of what they've said before. And I'll, and don't tell me how you want to get there. I'll figure out how to get there. And, uh, by season three, it was easy, especially when Tim and I are working together. Cause they're like, Hey, so we want to, and we'd be like, Nope, we're going <laughs> to do it this way. And they'd be like, okay. <laughs> So during this entire time, you're doing the Hollywood thing. You're in, you know, showbiz. Were you still practice? Like, were you like just taking leaves of absence uh, to do this? Yeah, that's actually what I had to do. So what ended up happening is, uh, you know, like I said, I did, I did a month worth of shooting um, on leave, and then I came back. I finished signing out, got my DD two fourteen, and then I was on terminal leave. And I had like, I had like sixty days, almost sixty days of terminal leave built up. And I went to work at, uh, at, with, for a hospital system here in central Texas. And then a week later I get the call and they're like, Hey, we're going to do the South America shoot in three weeks. Can you make it? And so I had to go to the department chief and I'm like, Hey, I, I have this offer to go do this thing. And they're like, well, you're kind of putting us in a bind. And I go, and I said, look, man, I understand people are going to have to cover down. I said, but it's not like we're not salaried employees. It's not like they're not going to get paid more for working my shifts. And, and I know some of them are actually going to welcome it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I'll, I'll do everything I can. If you want me to work more shifts this month to make up for it, 
I'm happy to do that. You know, uh, whatever we need to do. Uh, the long and the short of it was they didn't like it very much. And then uh, I ended up transferring to a different hospital, telling them, you know, hey, I just I just did a docu reality series. It's going to come out soon, and I'm going to probably do more of that. And they were like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we'll totally cooperate. And then when the time came and I said, I'm going to be gone for two months. They're like, oh, you were serious about that? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, I was because I'm the type of guy that when I say shit, I mean it. What was the role uh, you were hired for? Uh, what, what's that? You mean? Well, a, uh, oh, I, hospital, I was just as an attending physician. Yeah, I was an okay. attending physician. Yeah, in the ER. So and they're like, well, and so their big complaint was, and I want so you to know that, that I've watched a lot of Chicago med recently, so I know exactly what it's like to be an attending. A lot of people do. A lot of people know <laughs> from Chicago med exactly what everything's like because because medical shows are medical shows actually are more accurate than military shows, if you can believe that. I 100 percent believe it. Yeah, 100 uh, percent. Because because in Chicago med, they always have the same progression when a when a person uh heart stops, you know, mm -hmm. it's always the same progression. I've learned that progression over time. So I feel like in a crisis, you know, so you're I, one of those people that can criticize. Oh Bob yeah. hundred percent. Social media. Yeah, when he yeah. says something, he's like, yeah. ah, well, actually yeah. between, yeah. <laughs> between Chicago med and web MD, I'm basically a doctor. <laughs> yeah. So you, you know, basically everything you should be making COVID policy. Basically. <laughs> I, I, I probably would do a great job with it. I was going to say, <laughs> I don't know if you could do a worse job. <laughs> Well, so, but I, 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 go ahead. No, go ahead. I didn't mean to oh, cut no. you off. Yeah, go. No, I was just going to say that's, you know, everybody we, we've gone, we've run the gambit now from, you know, everybody being a uh, first, everybody was an expert in virology and immunology. Yep. Then they were an expert on uh, election fraud and jurisprudence. Then they were an, uh, an expert on what the definition of an insurrection is. And now they're all experts on uh, on foreign policy to include the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I'm really impressed. You know, you know, Facebook University has given out a lot of very high level uh, <laughs> yeah. degrees in the last couple of years. You, you missed macroeconomics. I uh, forgot. Macro <laughs> macroeconomics. <laughs> People like, yeah. yeah, well, this is what's going to happen to yeah. the economy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like I like the people that have try are trying to convince me that giving somebody their job back counts as growth. Oh, when, yeah, you, when you no. when you let somebody out of no. lockdown to go back to their job, that's growth. That's growing the economy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lockdown. Uh, I I don't think anybody can argue that that was that was a great a great win for anybody. You know. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, the, you know the whole it, er, early on. I was like, hey, you know what? We don't know what we don't know. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, two, and you, you and you two, and I had a phone conversation very early on, and I was like, I yeah. was like, we don't we don't know what we don't know. So yeah. hey, you know what? In theory, this two weeks to flatten the curve thing. Two in weeks theory. Two that weeks to flatten. Good. I was totally yeah. on board with two weeks yeah. to flatten the curve. Now that I, we're in week sixty three, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Well, they have, well, they, they, well, the United States hasn't gone back to lockdown, but other countries, like Australia, went back to it. Totally. Yeah. Australia's totally locked. Australia yeah, went like back to my, it. New Zealand my, went back to it. Um, I was reading an article about how a lot of Southeast Asian countries are good. Like it's not on the table. Basically they're like, no, uh, no. like Singapore, like dude, this devastated us. We're not doing so it. So here, here's what's really funny about Singapore is early, early on, right, there was all this pointing, all this data pointing, right? Like yeah. everybody pointed at Spain and said, that's totally what's going to happen in the U S Right. And I pointed out a number of reasons why that wasn't what was going to happen in the U.S. And then they pointed at Singapore as, oh, we totally need to be doing what Singapore is doing. And, and but they were talking about masks and social distancing. But if you peel back the onion on what Singapore did, if you had a positive contact, they moved you into I don't want to use the term concentration camp, but they moved you into forced housing yeah. for 14 days. Yeah. So you wouldn't be in, and that was the, whether you had a positive test or not. Yep. So you wouldn't be in contact with anybody else. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, you know, your point at Singapore, like there's some triumph, but that means you need to be prepared that somebody pulls up to your house in a van and, in and the COVID th van throws you in says, the back. Yeah. And yeah. says, come on, you're Hey, guess what? You get to go stay at the La Quinta for, for two weeks. And what we was the penalty? Your... What was the penalty for non-compliance? Cause Singapore is notoriously harsh for penalties. Well, it, you know, it's, uh, I, I guess, caning, I guess. I <laughs> I'm assuming they, I've never heard that they gave up on caning in Singapore. So I'm no, assuming have, it's still happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my, my biggest problem with the lockdown is 
Amazon gets to continue to work. Walmart. Yeah. No, all Walmart, the biggest operations. All the big operations. All the big ops. No, I agree. But, but all the small shops got shut down. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I think it's the biggest uh, uh, number Wealth of bankruptcies just, that yeah. we've had. I don't know. <sighs> totally. Since... I mean, I don't know. I mean, like it's it was significant. I think like uh, I've read 30... some economists r writings about you know the highest number of bankruptcies. Yeah, the biggest wealth mm -hmm. redistribution. Like to these companies, their the, coffers got way the, bigger. The middle class lost fourteen yeah. trillion dollars, and yeah. and the upper class gained fourteen trillion. There's like yeah. e-commerce because there, you know, obviously for us, e-commerce trends. E E-commerce went from like 20% of products were purchased online to over 40% of products were yep. purchased online, except for that 20% Delta, like was all concentrated into a handful yeah. of businesses. So, so like, I, I just think it's, it's an absurd notion that, that, uh, you know, and I, you know, I'm not like an anti wealth person, but like the wealthy, the largest companies were essentially allowed to risk their employees lives but small businesses couldn't risk their own life. You know, it's it's yeah. it was an insane concept. Um, yeah, that you know, I always look at it through the lens of like the people that are actually doing the work and small business mm -hmm. owners. And you know, I just thought it was an insane policy. And the fact that like anybody's considering doing it again, uh, yeah, like there's a vaccine available. If you want it, you can get it. If you don't, that you know, that's a risk that you choose to take. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know. I'm masking. I'm cool with if, if that's what people want. I'm cool with social distancing, but like we need to continue. Like life the, moves on. Life has to move on. Yeah. You take yeah, whatever, it, whatever it risk level you personally to. want. Yeah. And it's, you can't, you can't cripple everything. And I, I, I'm of the belief that, you know, I, I never attribute to malice what I can attribute to stupidity. Cause I think there's way <laughs> more sure. stupid people than evil people. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I don't think, I don't think that there was a room full of, uh, you know, uh, whatever Ro Rockefellers, Illuminati, uh, nah. what's no. the, what, whatever, whatever Grove that, uh, that, uh, uh info wars talks about. Um, the you know, I, I don't, this yeah, is a deep it, I don't think there was a room maneuver. full of people that said, all right, we're going to put mom and pop out of business so that Walmart can, I think what happened is when they were initially thinking about it, they're like, well, people are still going to need stuff. Yeah. And then yeah. companies like Walmart had a voice. Right. And they said, hey, look, we've got a plan. We can. Whereas mom and pop, they didn't have a voice. They don't have a voice. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I, I think it was I think it was incompetence and stupidity and short sightedness. But the results the same. Right. Yep. Is a lot of people. You know, I, I saw the post from people, you know, their, that their life uh, ambition was to own a gym and they had to sell their gym and yeah. sell all, you know, sell all the equipment and they couldn't pay the rent anymore. Yep. And, uh, you know, and the eviction moratoriums that, you it's know, preposterous, uh, you know, yeah. I imagine, you know, because I, I know people personally that, that own a rental property and that's part of their retirement plan. I right? think, is, yeah. is owning yeah. that rental I think property. an overwhelming yeah. majority yeah. of landlords are people that own one, two yeah. properties. They're, They're not, not the Kushners. We're not the Kushners. Like everyone's yeah. like can absorb these losses. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they, they own they own a duplex somewhere, right? Yeah. And yeah. and now that there's an eviction moratorium, they're paying a double mortgage because because the, there ain't no there ain't no fucking eviction moratorium or foreclosure moratorium nope. for yeah. those of us playing mortgages, right? There we was still no had to keep bank paying. loan freeze, yeah. right? Bank yeah. loan repayment freeze. There was nothing like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I I don't know, man. I saw it. You know, I think I do think you know COVID brought out the best in a lot of ways, brought out the worst in a lot of the ways. And some of the shit that I heard come out of the mouths of my fellow physicians, like. Oh, we should get, we should get hazard pay. We should have our student <laughs> loans forgiven just because we're showing up to work. And I'm like, fucking pound sand. You signed up for this. You know, if you don't, if you don't like it, do telemedicine. <laughs> all right. All right. We, we definitely went off track and we, yeah. de we definitely, you know, went down the, the COVID rabbit hole. And, but it's, I think it's okay to talk about like it, it, COVID had a massive effect on businesses you know, both, uh, you know, in a good way for a lot of, a lot of businesses were, were found and grew online during COVID, yeah. uh, but a lot of other businesses suffered and, 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 yeah. di and died. And I, you know, I think, I think that's important. I think it's one of those things that you always need to think about when you're starting a business is it's not just the things that you can control, but you, you have to know that there will be things that you cannot control. 
You know, mm -hmm. the uh, the tastes of the market change. Uh, there are crises, whether it's an economic crisis, crisis, a, a housing crisis. Uh, some, you know, with COVID, one of the major issues was supply issues. You know, from, which is from still a, being affected now. Still, yeah, Asia and South America. Like, there's a, there are delays and. Um, and these are things that you actually have, the longer you're in business, the more you plan for them, you start thinking about, Hey, if I'm selling something, I need to have at least a, a couple different ways to get this product in case something goes wrong. Um, and, and, you know, and those things matter, but, mm -hmm. but COVID was so significant that there were some businesses, there's just no way, you know, if you own a gym, how the hell do you, you know, the only way some gyms stayed open, like jujitsu gyms was because people like, you know, I kept paying my, my jujitsu gym for mm -hmm. my whole, for my whole freaking family for about a year. Uh, and it still wasn't open. And then I was like, all right, you know, I, I have contributed enough, but, right. uh, you know, that's the only way some of these places stayed open. Yeah. That's, so anyway, you know, the only, you, uh, so my jujitsu gym, what they ended up doing is, is as soon as it was allowable, is you know you would come in you had to be masked to come in you get a temperature check yep and they would they would ask you the covid questions yep. and then we had social distancing taped out on the mat yeah and and they would and they would tell everybody to bring an extra gi top if you had one and you were drilling against a gi top oh man not a partner yeah. or a dummy wow. yeah no partner well, dummies so are probably pretty expensive yeah i mean so time. we would yeah. do you know we would stretch out we would do you know shrimps stand in base um, you know, front rolls, back rolls, do it, you know, do a good warm up, And then we would, we were drilling with gi tops wow. until such, until such time that, and then they would say, all right, class is over. Now, if a group of people on their own accord wanted to. <laughs> to roll, you are welcome to do so. Wow. Right. But we can't do this as a formal part of the class, uh, you know, because we'll get in trouble for, you know, from the state. Yeah. The only reason that my, uh, my, my fitness gym, my fitness gym actually was closed. Um, but I, I was allowed by the owner to go in and work because he, cause he's like, I know you're going to be there. You work out at a time of day that nobody goes anyway. And you, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. And you've, you've got the code to go in. So yeah, you can go in there. There was only one there. It did get to the point that, um, there was a very brief time period where I couldn't go at all because the state specifically said hey we're closing gyms and yes we're going to drive around and look oh, yeah okay. so he's yeah, like you yeah. know if, if you're people or whatever if you're there yeah. and they knock on the door and you answer the door you know and i'm like i can answer the door with a mop in my hand and he's like no 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 we <laughs> so don't like, want to risk it so you're like hiding <laughs> yeah yeah basically so during that during that time denise and i were working out here at home he was you know yeah. he, was, he was programming workouts for me and i was working out here at home yeah all right so switching gears right yeah. you've got a new business I do have a new business and it's, and it, it was kind of born out of COVID. So talk about yeah, it. Yeah. I, so, um, well, you know, so as an older guy, um, but as Nick said, I'm 55. Um, from the time I reached age 40, really, I started noticing, you know, the, really the challenges working out wasn't as easy. Recovery took longer. Um, it's, you can't, you can't treat your 40 year old body the way you treated your 20 or 30 year old body. It's just, it is different. It's physiologically different. Time is a real thing and there's no getting around it. And I know, unfortunately I was a 40 year old intern. So I was, you know, working terrible hours, not getting enough sleep, eating shit. Where were you interning uh, at? Uh, I was interning in San Antonio. So that's, you know, I did, I did a three year residency program. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I started as an intern at age 40 and then, you know, graduated at 43. Hey, we still uh, have time to be doctors. No, yeah, I don't think so. Do. It sound, he sounded very smart, and he because he, he said he finished his service and went right to medical school. And I'm like, I have you have no prerequisites. Maybe we maybe you and I should go to medical school together. That'd be kind of funny. <laughs> That'd be a hoot. That'd be kind of funny. I, like, That's a reality like, show. Yeah, I would like, watch. Like sitting in a class with a bunch of 18 year olds taking orgo chemistry, and they're like, "Oh, this is." I'm like, "What is that?" <laughs> hey, uh, okay. So I thought I was hot shit. Cause I got an A in, in organic chemistry as an undergrad. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And then fucking biochem handed me my ass when I got to medical school. I don't know the difference between those subjects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I couldn't <laughs> colloquially just explain the difference between biochem and yeah, organic. I, I don't want to no. get into it cause I'll break out in, in PTSD hives, but <laughs> yeah, it's bad. It's bad. But, um, 
I, so you know how there are physics guys and there are yeah. chemi chemistry guys. I yeah. was definitely a physics guy. Physics yeah. always made perfect sense to me. Yeah. Chemistry was always a nightmare. Yeah. But I still remember like all the structural bullshit, like one S two, two S two, two P six. You know yeah, what I'm yeah. talking about? Yeah. Like, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Still here. Still in my head, wasting space. Cause I'll never yeah. need that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're never going to need it. Unless yeah. Albert and I become doctors together, which I there think is a good idea. That's uh, highly unlikely. <laughs> highly, highly unlikely. I mean, I've, I've already told you I'm done with school. Like, I can't learn. I, I also, I can't, I, I've I can't, always hated school. I cannot learn new things. The last anymore. time I enjoyed school was when I was at, when I lived in Italy and I was at Montessori. I loved, <laughs> I loved Montessori. And then I came to the United States <laughs> and they were like, you know, sit in this row. To, well, yeah, sit in this row. <laughs> don't move. Uh, and also, uh, Nick, if you, you say anything in Italian, uh, people will beat you up. Uh, <laughs> so that was, that was Massachusetts. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> and I hated school. I, I hate, you know, even though like, you know, I did not enjoy class at West Point. I did not enjoy class at Duke. Uh, I don't want to go brag. back to school, except so, as a dare to become a doctor with Albert. <laughs> you, you need to, Nick, you need to write a novelization of your, of your, uh, of your school years. And you need to call it Montessori to mass holes. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's, that's going to be a bestseller. Done. <laughs> Montessori is awesome. It's yeah. great. Oh, I can imagine. I can so, imagine. It was great. So Mike, yeah. you're sitting there as an intern. In San yeah. Antonio, you're an older yeah. guy. Are the, yeah. I mean, and you're feeling, it sounds like you're feeling different. You're feeling maybe beat like up shit. a little. Yeah. yeah. Where like yeah. your classmates or fellow interns, like, look at this old fuck. <laughs> He's got no energy. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, I didn't, I was fucking worn out all the time. And then, and I, the thing was, is, is I knew, you know, residency is three years. And then I've got a six year commitment to go, you know, and I want to go back to soft, you know, yeah, that, because I mean, that was my whole thing was I wanted yeah. to go back to the soft community. And, uh, once I found out what my job was going to be, that's, I mean, I had kind of started figuring this out before that, but really once, once I got the offer to, to go to the J and I, and I knew what that entailed, uh, that really lit a fire under me. And I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I gotta, I gotta figure this out. You know, this, you know, gone are the days where I get up in the morning and, uh, you know, and, uh, put a dip of Copenhagen in and drive in somewhere. And then, uh, you know, rinse my mouth out and like, eh, I feel like running eight miles today, or I feel like running three miles really fast today. And then, uh, and then I'm going to come back and do some burpees or whatever. So, so gone was that I knew I had to have a plan. That was the biggest thing. So I had to do a deep dive into, okay, well, why, why does it take longer for my body to react? You know, what, what my body's changing. What are these changes that are happening? Right. It was like an after school special. Yeah. And I, I had to figure all that out. <laughs> oh God, that would be such a, we should shoot that. We should actually shoot, <laughs> shoot that in the classroom. It, style? Like we shoot it just like an after Hi, school Billy. special. Your like body's a changing. Lifetime movie. <laughs> What's going but, on with but my body? But it's, but it's for, yeah. for 40 year old dudes, you know, it's yeah. like, and it, like, and it, why, and why, it, why am I doing the same thing I used to do, but I'm not skinny anymore. You know, yeah. like, why am I tired? You need, you know, so you remember the, in those after school specials or actually it was the, the, the one, the educational ones that you would see at school. Right. And it would say, this is Billy. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then it would show like the diagram of what's happening to Billy's body. Yeah. So you need that. But then the balls like sag all the way down. <laughs> to the your scrotum will continue yeah. to extend to the ground. The guts hanging out. You're getting man boobs, you know, all this shit that comes with middle age, you know? You get the scientific term, then the, then the slang terms like yeah. you will, you know, your as your testosterone levels decrease, yeah. you're yeah. Sitting, hormonal imbalances yeah. in your chest area. You're sitting on your moves. ass a lot more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, and you don't need as much food as you used to, even though yeah. you want that food. That's why those those uh, what are those are they are they Geico commercials? The the people homeowners becoming their parents. Yeah, you're yeah. becoming your parents. I yeah. fucking love those. I think it's great TV, the but yeah, they're ever. good. Yeah, very good. But that was that was a difficult time for me. So I had to figure all this shit out. So I started I started talking to guy, guys in my class. Like uh, a, a great reference for me was a guy named Drew Wingy, who was one of my classmates. He was already board certified in family medicine. Uh, uh, he was a, a, a big jujitsu practitioner, a big MMA guy, a bodybuilder. So he kind of, he kind of knew a lot of shit about, yeah. you know, what supplements work, what don't work, what you should be doing with your diet. Um, you know, talking to him about that, 
was a big thing. And then seeking out, you know, when, whenever, when I was on inpatient wards, talking to a nutritionist and doing a deep dive into the literature, figuring out what, what supplements work, what supplements don't work, who do I need to talk to about this? And just talking to people who did seem to have it figured out. And I found out there was a lot of background noise, but when you distilled it all down, there was, there was a way that it could be done. Yeah. And, uh, I ended up being in, in, in my forties being in pretty damn good shape. You know, the whole time I was in the unit, I had a little bit of hiccup in there and I talk about it in the book. I figured out, you know, when, uh, basically like, like a lot of us, um, I had low T and, and ended up having to get uh, on testosterone replacement. Um, but really other than that, that, that was like the only hiccup really that I had because I was able to map it out. Mm. And that was kind of the, that was something that I had in my toolbox for a while. And I had talked about on my podcast before got a lot of emails about, it. I was always getting the emails, doc, what supplements should I take doc? What, mm. kind of, what do you think about this diet or that diet? Yeah. What do you think about CrossFit? What do you think about this? Am I too old to go to jujitsu? I've got a back injury, blah, 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 blah. And I was answering all the same questions again and again and again. And I said, you know what? I've answered these questions so many times. They need to, I, I had a kind of a come to Jesus moment uh, in, in talking with uh, somebody at the publishing company. And I'm like, I'm just going to put all this in a book. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll just, it'll just all be in one location. Yeah. And I'd actually already started kicking off Graybeard performance at that time because, because I hated going to buy supplements and having to buy each and every, and every individual ingredient in the amounts that I needed it to be in these, these bottles, just lining up. I'm like, you know, when I knew damn good and well that five or six of these could be combined into one pill rather easily. And I'm like, so Why? wait, I, <clears throat> quick question. Yeah. Are you telling me that the Flintstone might multivitamin that I take every day is not getting the job done? You know, uh, actually, I'll tell you that the, I think the Flintstone vi multivitamin is, is underrated. You know, because yeah. you know, they they were free and plentiful on deployment, right? So I, I would take them <laughs> a lot of times on deployment. Yeah, because yeah. they're and, easy, right? And it's, they're delicious. Then they're delicious. Yeah, you know, yep. I would take I would take, uh, and and if you feel like you you know you wake up with a little post nasal drip, you take two, right? Yeah, that's my policy as well. Yeah, <laughs> totally. You, you, are you hearing this? I mean, I don't this know. I don't, I don't think medically doctor, sound. Dr. Paul Machado <laughs> yeah. has a nice ring to it. Yeah. I don't take any Dr. supplements. So? Yeah. I don't take any supplements. I take yeah. them all. But, I, but I, I figured I out there was should. some other stuff and I experimented a little bit. I had other people telling me about different in, in the supplement chapter of my book. I talk about it. And that was when I came up with Graybeard Performance. And uh, actually, Nick, it was a conversation with you. Remember, I was I was pretty much only focused on the supplement aspect of it yep. and, and on yep. your advice. You said, no, man, make it a life and lifestyle brand. And I'm like, wow, that's that's a way better idea because that's it's a little bit more catchy. It kind of brings people in a little bit more. It's a little more all encompassing. And I have people that buy my apparel, buy my my uh, geese and rash guards mm -hmm. and follow me on social media. And maybe they take a supplement or maybe they don't because, you know, maybe they've already maybe they already have a supplement brand that they like that, that yeah. they're going. Yeah. With. I yeah. want I want to back yeah. it up just a moment in, mm -hmm. in regards to like how you got started. So. You know, by all accounts, most people would assume that you were well to do financially. You were mm -hmm. in medicine, you're practicing medicine, you're doing great. Why did what made you want to start this business and put, you know, capital risk or time risk or something else on the line in order to get it going? Because I, I believe you self funded this, correct? You didn't go out for yeah. venture funding. Oh, no, yeah, this like is, that, yeah, totally. I had no right? investors. Yeah. So you, you uh, decided to say, hey, I want to do this because what? Yeah, it's I mean, you, you go to work in the ER every day. And again, I, you know, I chose emergency medicine because it was the best fit for me personality wise and also the bet, best fit for me mm -hmm. to treat trauma on the battlefield. Mm. And then, uh, you know, it's, uh, this is going to sound like a like a bad, you know, Vietnam documentary. <laughs> and then you come home. Right. <laughs> and 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 things have changed. It's you know, then it's you know, it's I've got a fever. No, you're 98.6. Well, for me, that's a fever, you know, <laughs> you know, dealing with that shit, you know, med, re med refills. Yeah. He went from, you guys are like, laughing. Yeah. No, no, yeah. No, I like, no, I'm I listening know, to him. I'm like, I'm, I'm yeah. imagining him like yeah. on the battlefield, you know, like this guy's been wounded. He's critical. I'm going to save his yeah. life. And then the next yeah. day, some yeah. guy's complaining about it. I'm 99 degrees. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> yeah. And you know, you, you know, people coming problem. in. It's like, uh, you know, I've got, I've got abdominal pain and you're like, yeah, you know, you've had, I read here that you've had abdominal pain for six months and you've had 
five CAT scans and, you know, three MRIs, you know, what's different about it today? You know, it's, well, you're working today. That's what's different about it today. You know, it's, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that to dislike about, uh, about emergency, me emergency medicine in the U S and I was in, it, it gets, it gets frustrating. You start to get jaded over time mm. and it's, uh, and you're always working for somebody else, right? Cause it's not, unless you're one of these guys that, um, you know, some ER physicians, you know, started these, uh, these standalone ERs because, because so a doctor can't own a hospital, right? That's, that's against the law, right? I did not know that. Uh, yeah. It's so, you know, you have, you have the hospital and then you have, you know, you have groups with it. It's, it's a weird, I can't even explain the whole structure of how it works. But. I, I guess it makes sense because as a doctor, you, you can't be thinking about the business side of, right. why? of treatment. Right. But why is that? Why is that a yeah. regulation? Why is it a regulation? Oh, oh, yeah. you mean for the ethics portion? I'm of saying it. the ethics yeah. portion. Like, okay, if you know like, that, I can't do this because if it's you know really this, this person think... doesn't have insurance or something, right. and, yeah. you, and you have to treat something that you know is going to cost you like twenty grand, like you yeah, might maybe you don't maybe you don't live you don't go as hard. Yeah, maybe maybe you're <laughs> like yeah, you don't really need a cat scan. You could just. Uh, here. Well, I'm thinking more like ER style. Sir, like, did you, you just yeah. take a Polaroid like, of me? No, no, this yeah. is a this is a new technology. <laughs> I'm thinking more. Hey, like it looks ER. good. You can go home. Yeah, I'm thinking more well, like ER style, it's... like the chainsaws in your body and the docs. Like, no, <laughs> uh, can't pull that out right now. <laughs> it, it also ends up, you know, this is, you know, of course, the thing that people we hear from people all the time. Well, medicine is a business, and you're not patients; you're customers. So they don't want to cure you because they want you to keep coming back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's not that's not true, but I totally understand where that comes from. It's like, yeah. it's again, it's not, it's not maliciousness. It's just a fucked up system that causes that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, th there's these weird end arounds, you know, and these standalone ERs are one of these weird end arounds, right. Where, you know, phys you know, physicians group together and they, they buy this and they build this dock in the box, this, this standalone ER. And I, I didn't really want to do something like that. Cause I'm like, you know, it's, it's still the same shit. It's still, I'm still going to work and seeing the same bullshit. Um, and I don't, I, that's bullshit that I don't want to see. And, mm. and the justification that you hear from up on high, right. Is like, well, these bullshit patients are the ones because they're low risk. Right. And uh, those are the ones that pay the bills. Those are yeah. the ones that keep the lights mm. on yeah, yeah. so you can see the real emergency patients. And if you get down to the nuts and bolts, bolts of it, that's really not true. That's really complete bullshit. Um, and I, I just became pretty disillusioned with the whole emergency medicine thing. So I'm like, I, I want to be my own boss. I want, mm. and I want something that's, that's scalable. So how do I go about that? And, you know, my, my first thought was, was similar to what I was doing, you know, with, with sheepdog response was, well, I can teach, I can teach trauma. You know, I spent, I have a lot of years invested in me in, in learning how to be an expert in battlefield trauma and I can teach that. But again, it's one of those things that's not really scalable. It's you still got to show up and teach that yeah, class. It's your time. You know, it's not like I'm going to franchise yep. myself into <clears throat> yeah. it. So uh, it, it was one of those things. I, I was doing it for myself already with, you know, figuring out what supplements I needed to take. And, and I'm like, you know what? This this I can just brand this. I can I can I can make I can make the convenience that I want in having the supplements that I know are going to work and that I know that I need to take and are going to help me to be more fit and more healthy. And I can share that with other people and I can share the data that I used to come up with these and, you know, and put my name on it as a physician, not just some Joe, um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, what's, what's the stuff uh, like, like blue emu. I don't know what the fuck is in blue emu. <laughs> right? I don't know if a doctor had anything to do with that. Um, you know, but this stuff it's, you know, I, I put my name on it cause I know everything, everything that I put into my supplements um, I've done research on, I've done real research on not watching YouTube videos. Yeah. So I know that there's clinical trials to, to show this stuff works. So talk about, but, talk about the, the company, you know, yeah. Graybeard. what, 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 uh, what, what is encompassed under that banner right now? Um, yeah. what successes have you had? Where are you trying to go? What are your challenges? Like, by the way, yeah. the name is very good. It clearly tells who this product's it's for. A good I, I think it's a very well-selected name. Yep. Graybeard Performance. I appreciate that. I've, Great. I've actually only had one person ever criticize the name and, uh, it was just some internet troll just criticized the name. Didn't, so. didn't like it because you might not have a beard. Was Maybe that the, was that the attack? Yeah, I don't know. Like it's, I, I was very a, gender specific. I am a beardless. Women can have gray beards too. I am a okay? beardless man, and I'm fine with the name. I like. Okay, it. <laughs> that's, that, that's all. That's all that counts. That's all that matters, right? Um, yeah. So I, 
I, I kind of say that it, our, our mission statement is, uh, is, uh, to help the seasoned warrior athlete, right? So somebody who's not content to like, okay, I only, I'm only going to put out enough energy to, to go out and play golf and I'm going to ride the cart and smoke a cigar for nine of those holes. So it's not really <laughs> a workout. Right. So that's, you know, kind of the, the, the average middle-aged dude. And, and I want people to understand that, you know, what's average doesn't have to be normal. You know, you don't, you don't have to, to look at that and say, well, that's what all my friends are doing. So that's, yeah. you know, I'm going to read books about submarines and I'm going to, I'm going to smoke a brisket <laughs> every Saturday and brew my own beer. You know, uh, I mean, if you want to do those things, great. You know, that sounds like a lot of fun, but you can also say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to enter a Spartan race or, you know, the tactical games <clears> and, and do shit like that. Uh, or, or I'm going to go, I'm going to go do a drop in and grapple with Gordon Ryan this weekend you know, stuff like that. You can still do that, you know, even though you might be past the 40 year mark. And, and I want guys to know that they can do that. And I, and I gear this, it, obviously it's, it's, you know, gender specific because I've never been a 40 year old woman. So I don't know how to address that. There's the still parents. time. <laughs> What's that? There's still time. You, well, well it's, it's, it's 2021. So you can just identify as a woman. Yeah, it's can, fine. I know I can identify as a woman, but am I allowed to identify my age too? I think, I think that? so. This is a thing that has come up. Like you yeah. can't, you can do that. Now. Okay. You can do that. Maybe, maybe I, and maybe I will. And then I'll write another book. You know, <laughs> and I'll call it gray something else. I don't know. Yeah. You know. No, this uh, is, this is the no, to continue on. I, I, so I've noticed myself. So I'm 41. Same mm -hmm. thing as what you're describing in that I've like pushed like who I look up to, to like what you're talking about. Like I'm looking for people and trying to align my lifestyle to people that I think have like are doing cool shit at an old yeah. age. The person mm -hmm. I've, I've zeroed in on right now is this guy, uh, Don Wildman. He was the founder of Bally's. Oh, apparently no he was. So he, when he sold Bally's gym, yeah, mm -hmm. um, he just became like a invention, an adventure guy. Like yeah. he was like paddleboarding and uh, stand up nice. paddleboarding. Like into his eighties, he was still surfing wow. and paddleboarding. He eventually died at eighty five of old age, but like they said, he was surfing at 83. 83 years old, still able to paddle out and That's do all that shit. So I mean, he had to be doing something right. Like I don't yeah, know exactly yeah, what he was yeah. doing, but he was doing something right. Yeah. See, and, and that's the thing is you can do that. It's we've been sold this bill of goods and I, and I almost fell into it myself. Right. When I, when I, when I retired out of the military, I already, I owned a Harley. Right. And I, you know, I owned a, I owned a big cruiser. Right. So the, you know, the one that you can do long, long rides on weekends and, you know, go, go to the casinos up in Oklahoma and stuff. I, I caught myself doing shit like buying fat guy shirts. Right? <laughs> and you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Right. I, and it's like, okay, this, this is going to be who I am. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy my retirement and, and do all this stuff. And it's like, I'm not really enjoying this. I was, I was liking a lot. I was liking it a lot more when I was collapsing in a puddle of sweat mm. or when, you know, when I had, had gloves and shin pads on and was getting clocked in the yeah. face you yep. know, or I was on the jujitsu mat. I was really, I was enjoying that a lot more. Why can't I still do that? Yeah, I can absolutely still do that. Yeah. So, you know that, and I want people to be able to do, but if you don't, you don't, but yeah. you know, you can still take care of your body and you can, you can wear a, you can wear a smaller, smaller size of the fat guy shirt. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that like I've definitely found is I used to not worry about things like rest or if I got injured, I'd just power through it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't do anything like that anymore. Like if I, if something's hurt a little bit, I now know that if I keep pushing it and it gets really hurt, it's going to mm -hmm. be six, a six month problem instead of a one week problem. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but I still would rather grapple than do anything else. Yeah. I still would rather, you know, uh, spar or, or hit a bag or, you know, I'd rather do that than, you know, go, you know, go run a marathon or, you know, whatever the hell people like to do, you know? So, so I keep doing that stuff. I just have to impose the limits I impose are more about, uh, about recovery mm -hmm. that, you know, because I feel, I still feel young on the mat. Like when I'm rolling, even when I'm getting mauled by, you know, Tim Kennedy and his, and Sean and those guys that are just mm -hmm. exponentially better than I'll ever be. Um, I still feel good out there. It's later when I, after I shower and sit on the couch and then try to move again, that's mm -hmm. what, that's when I feel old. Like, I thought, oh God, 
I thought it's just involuntary yoga session. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. You, you were so stretching. When, <laughs> when I think, so when I feel my absolute oldest, <clears throat> so when I feel, uh, what, what time is it right now? So it's, uh, we're, we're coming up on, yeah. on six here, right? Yeah. So when I feel my, my absolute oldest was, uh, you know, sub, subtract time, go back to 3 AM my time. Yeah. So, cause, cause yesterday I had, uh, really hard strength workout in the morning, mm -hmm. which included the, the exercise that I hate more than, than probably anything in the world, which is safety bar reverse lunges. Mm. Don't, which I just absolutely don't despise. Know safety bar reverse lunge. Yeah, I thought I thought, I thought you were going to say Van Dam splits, but okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I couldn't do one of those if I tried. But, uh, I had among other things, I had safety bar reverse lunges in yesterday's workout, and then I had two hours of jujitsu last night. So the three a.m. piss, getting out of bed to do the three a.m. piss, <laughs> when every joint in your body tells you what a dumbass you are. But but the nice thing about it is 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 I, I feel that in the middle of the night, but you know, because, because I'm taking turmeric, because I'm taking other stuff, because I stretch, because I give myself time to recovery, really, by the time I wake up in the morning, I feel pretty damn good. Nice. And, and by the time I've hydrated, taken my morning supplements and, uh, just kind of piddle around the house a little bit and I've loosened up, I went, you know, I went to the gym and, and had a killer workout today and didn't feel any of that. But I always, I always tell people typically Thursday, Thursday nights. Um, I'm not going to go to MMA class tonight. If I went to MMA class tonight, tonight would be worse. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it's, it used to be when I wasn't doing everything right, when it came to diet, when it came to hydration supplements and rest, that was a morning pain. I would get up, it, I would get up in the morning and be like, Oh, my whole day is fucked. Yeah. And, and now it's, mm, I start feeling it on the drive home. I feel it a little bit during the night. Um, but really by the time I wake up, I feel good. Nice. Yeah. So, so what challenges have you had with Graybeard so far? It's pretty new. Yeah. So, you know, what, what's the hardest thing that you found so far as a, as a neophyte, uh, <laughs> entrepreneur? <laughs> uh, well, and oddly enough, I'm talking to you and, uh, I hate marketing <laughs> we, we do too what we yeah. found out is we do too i love <laughs> i love marketing albert albert hates it no i'm joking I, I hate i hate marketing and i'm not real good at it you know i feel i feel like it so like i, I went and looked at property about six months ago and i'm still getting text messages from realtors like hey i was doing some properties this weekend and that's kind of like what hey i got these supplements that's kind of like what i feel like in everybody's timeline and i know you have to do that to grow the business but it just, it just, it just feels kind of unnatural for me. So the, the marketing aspect of it has been kind of difficult. Um, I've been, en I've enjoyed the process of kind of figuring out the mechanics, like, okay, I want to make supplements. How do I make my own supplements and finding mm -hmm. the companies that were going to do that. And then talking to people in the industry, talking to people at, at five star and going, Hey, this is the company I'm thinking about going with. What do you know? Are they shady? You know, is there going to be Elkhorn in some of my shit? You know, do I need to worry? <laughs> you know, and they're like, no, 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 that's a good company. That's a, it's, you know, so I went you know, with NutriCaps is the company that I go went with in Georgia that makes my supplements. So, you know, finding them, finding somebody to design my logo for my labels and for my apparel and everything, uh, finding a gi company and a rash guard company. Um, all of that's been pretty fun. And, uh, you know, setting up the website, even on, on Shopify has been yeah. pretty fun and pretty interesting, but um, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a numbers guy. I, I don't, I don't, the accounting aspect of it. I absolutely just hate, and I don't like the, the marketing aspect of it. So luckily I have, you know, my wife, Denise takes care of a lot of the backside support stuff, you know, as far as the accounting and managing the bank account, letting me know if there's enough capital in there to do a reorder, uh, or, or to, you know, to pay for, you know, marketing stuff or whatever it might be. Um, th those have been the kind of the, some of it's been fun, you know, the yeah. formulations are fun, finding the company to do it, uh, and, and cooperating with them on getting the labels made and everything. All of that's been fun. A lot of the little detail stuff, you know, I, I don't like doing, um, but it, it comes with the business and it's important to understand, at least understand it, even if you're not the one doing it. Yeah. So are you still practicing medicine as well? I have, uh, as of now I have stopped practicing clinically. Mm -hmm. Um, a large part of that had to do with COVID because I was, I was what they call a locums doc. 
So I was only, uh, I wasn't working for one hospital anymore. I had, uh, I had privileges at a few different hospitals mm. that when they needed somebody would say, Hey, we got two shifts coming up next month. Can you come work those shifts? And during COVID when people were staying out of the ERs and, and censuses went down, they were actually, you know, some hospitals that might've had three physicians on a shift were going down to as, as few as one. So the, the shifts just weren't there anymore. So I, I worked like four shifts kind of early on in COVID and then um, ended up going 12 months without working a shift. And they notified me, they said, hey, you've gone 12 months without working. So we really can't keep your credentials active anymore. And at that point, uh, I was full speed ahead with Graybeard. Um, the book was just about to get published. It was in the editing phase. And I'm like, you know what? That's fine. It's, uh, you know, I, I have a side gig. <clears throat> I work... Uh, I was medical director for a company, a company called Persis Medical um, that has now been bought out by a company called Safeguard Medical, and I am their, their global clinical advisor. So, um, so I have a, a steady paycheck and really good work with them. It's an, an absolutely amazing company that's doing all the right things for all the right reasons. Um, unlike some, some companies out there, I can honestly say that about Safeguard. Um, really happy to be involved with them, just like I was really happy to be involved with Persis. And of course, I get my retirement pay as well. So the bills are paid and that kind of gives me that freedom to, yeah. to work on the entrepreneurial side. So we we're, we're over an hour, which we don't usually like to do, but it's because you've done so many different things. I, <laughs> I, I do want to ask you, um, because this is a world that I lived for a while. What's it like mm -hmm. having the day job and trying mm -hmm. to be an entrepreneur? Uh, it's challenging, but because, uh, because so much of my day job is done right on this same computer from my home, it makes it easy. So yeah, yeah I don't, I don't have to go, I don't have to go to an office somewhere and then be worrying about, you know, taking a, taking a call because, uh, Oh, my labels came out printed upside down or something, you know, something weird like that is I, I get up in the morning and, and, you know, because I feel that my loyalty has to be to the company, that is, that is paying me of, of course, yeah. before my own company first. Right. So the, the first thing I do when I fire up my laptop is I look at, I, I read all my company emails, answer all company emails. If there's anything that specifically needs my attention, like, Oh, Hey, we need a reference or, you know, do you know if there's an article on this? I devote my time to that. Yep. I make sure everything that has to do with, with the, with the company that is paying me a paycheck is on course then I transition to, okay, what, what orders came in through Shopify overnight? Do I, you know, do I, how, how's my, are my stock levels? Okay. Here's my, my social media post for today. Um, do a quick double check, uh, uh, make sure that I'm keeping the boss happy, run and do my midday workout, come back. Usually that's when my, my inbox fills up again. Uh, cause everybody's responding to the emails that I replied to in the morning. Um, I take care of all that. And then uh, usually that gives me enough time um, as the business day is winding down between that and getting ready to go to jujitsu that I have time to, to, to recalibrate and go back to uh, the gray beard side of it again. And, you know, see, you know, any, any comments that I got on social media, I need to respond to yeah. any, uh, any email questions or anything like that. Yeah. As your business, I'm telling you right now, uh, that Ranger Up was like that in the early years. Yeah. As you get more successful, your life will become a nightmare. And I look, <laughs> yeah, I look, sure. I look, I look forward to that for you. I do too. I look, I look forward to that. I, I honestly, I do. I look I, forward to it. Based on what you said, though, I think mm -hmm. you won't like it because you didn't like repetition. Yeah. The problem with shipping and fulfilling is, yeah. man. There's nothing more repetitive. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. <laughs> no, that's, that's true. But, but I mean, the good thing is, so I I'm selling so little, you know, there, cause there was a while there and, and Nick knows this. I was selling individual first aid kits out of my garage and I actually technically still am. They're still on the website. And, uh, that was okay. I got it. You know, I would, I, I, I tried the, I'm going to make 20 of them. I'm going to sit down in an afternoon and put 20 of them together. And then, you know, I've got 20, I'm 20 ahead to fill orders. Yeah. You know, I, I did that for a while and, you know, now I do the, I make one as I get an order. Cause you know, because the volume has dropped off cause I've concentrated on other products and you know, that, like you say, I didn't, that was totally repetitive. You know, it's, I'm, yeah. I'm doing this. It's not scalable. I got to do this. 
you know, yeah. I, I considered actually, you know, getting a warehouse. Um, I, I, I have relatives that, that own a couple of warehouses in Laredo. And I actually had some people that wanted to go to work for me to do that if I wanted to do it on a larger scale, but I wasn't really interested in it. And the, the, the nice thing is with, uh, I'm, I've got the geese and the rash guards in my garage, but everything else I don't have to touch. So to me, it's all just numbers and characters on, on, on my screen, got it. which I don't mind. I mean, to me, that's just, I see, you know, I, Oh, I did $250 of business today. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, pour so, some more coffee. I feel pretty good about that. So how's business going and, and what's the next step for you to get to the next level? Uh, business is going good right now. Um, and a large part of that has to do with, I'm, I've, I did get some, uh, a certain amount of synergy from my book being published. So that that's, mm. that's driven people to the brand, which has been awesome. My next, the next step for me is, is twofold. I already know, uh, I have two SKUs of my supplements out now, um, which is my longevity formula, my energy formula. The next two SKUs that are going to be coming are vitality formula and sleep formula. So I've got my eye on a time frame of when I'll have the capital that I can go ahead and launch into those, which I'm pretty excited about. Cause I've already gotten, I've gotten, I, that was already my plan in my head. And I've already gotten inquiries from people who've read the book. They want to know, especially vitality formula. Everybody wants to know when that's going to be coming out. Probably because I mentioned that it's a natural uh, nitric oxide booster, which means it's an organic boner pill. So people are, <laughs> people are pretty obviously pretty excited about that. So uh, that I'm gonna I'm looking at that, looking to expand the website. Um, uh, I was on Kyle Lamb's podcast, and he talked about that I used to on my my Dr. Mike Simpson site. Um, I used to blog, and he goes, "You really need to start blogging again." So I think I'm gonna start uh, start blogging again as kind of a companion to the book. Yep. Um, and, and that'll also bring people in. I'm either going to do it as an, as an on the website thing or as a newsletter, I haven't decided yet, but, uh, I, I want to really provide that, that holistic approach to fitness, <clears throat> you know, not just you're coming here to buy products. So yeah. I want to, I want it to be informative as well. And, uh, and, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to look at doing actual marketing, hopefully with you guys in the near future. Awesome. If you could give, let's give doc, a free marketing tip. Go ahead and just tell, what do you think he should do next? I, I already have, I'll, I'll start. If, if you're on a budget mm -hmm. and you want to do something impactful, I would invest mm -hmm. very much so. Mm -hmm. Wait, hold on, time out. What do I need to do, Hollywood? You need to look here instead of down at the, at the desk. Well, I'm thinking, that's how I think. 50% of your look is the desk, just letting you know. All right. He's getting, we're getting chewed out by Hollywood right <laughs> I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things I would recommend is an activation of some sort. So getting, it's a simple thing to do, but you need to get your product in the hands of people and go ahead and just film them. Um, yeah. and see there, especially if you could get an activation is to get this in the, in the hands of people. Um, testimonials for sure is something that you should be looking for. So some people might want to, it might cost you not too much because you could say, hey, I'll give you a subscription to the product for let's mm -hmm. say a year, mm -hmm. but I need you to come here to me so mm -hmm. that I can film you saying what this has done for you. Um, gotcha. And the reason why we always say testimonials because if you pay an actor, inevitably someone's going to be able to figure out that that's an actor, or that's bullshit. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And so, getting those pieces will in in the supplement industry specifically, I see work really well. It's it's not like too far out there, but mm -hmm. people need to know people like them are doing this. That's right. that's the first thing I would invest in. So you're telling me if it's the same dude that was in the My Pillow commercial, it looks suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, if they're a recognizable actor, it becomes a problem. Unless they're willing to say, like, you know, I'm that's a pitch man, right? I'm Frank Thomas. Well, and I, I take I, eugenics too. I think I think he has to be the pitch man. I, I think I would I no, believe that, that I'm talking about the testimony. No, no, I know, oh, I, yeah, know okay. I know, I know. Yeah. But I, I think you need a video that is an honest video, you know, a scripted video, mm -hmm. um, that you know, that with you as the as the main character explaining why this is something that people need introducing people not not only to the brand concept but also the, what's missing in the other uh in the other supplements yeah what's missing mm -hmm. in the other supplements but your credentials you, mm -hmm. your story is great like you're you're sitting here going look if you want to be a you know be able to do badass stuff you know into your 50s mm -hmm. like this is what i think you need you know if you're over 40 and you want to keep being a bad here's what i've done since turning 40 i've mm -hmm. become i've become a doctor I mm -hmm. was an attending physician. I was on hunting Hitler. I wrote a book and now I've developed this specific brand of supplements. 
because I was and, already adding all this shit together in like 47 bottles and mm -hmm. I've put it all into one bottle for you because I want you to be able to do the things that I, I was doing. That would be my first commercial. I would put a lot of time and effort into that. Yeah. And especially if they could see how you're living today. Yep. And then if, if the t it, wor it works into this weaves into the testimonial portion, but if you do have people that are taking your supplements that are just, you know, amazing people that are at, you know, whatever age they're at, mm -hmm. having them, showing them doing whatever it is their preferred hobbies. Like you mentioned yeah. Spartan, like you mentioned mm -hmm. Jiu Jitsu, like you mentioned marathon cycling, it doesn't matter what it is. People just need to see like, Oh, I can, I can become that. And yep. that'll, yeah. that'll solidify it. Well, and the cool thing now is I'm at the point where I, I've got a, a couple of different customers that are on their eighth month of the subscription of the supplements. So and they're, they're yeah. <laughs> so they're getting a 30 day supply and then yeah. they're, and they're on round eight now. So, yeah. you know, the, you know, pe people are believing in it and, and people are seeing awesome. real results from it. That so, is awesome. Congratulations, yeah. man. Thank All right, you. So, Thank so you. you know, closing this out, where can people get Graybeard performance? Where do they find you? What, what are all your, what are, what's all your information? Yeah. So, uh, go to graybeardperformance.com and it doesn't matter how you spell the word gray. Cause I made sure that the domain's linked. So even if <laughs> I spell it with an E, but if you spell it with an A, you're still going to get there. So graybeardperformance.com, uh, that's going to give you uh, a link to everything, to my, my supplements, uh, apparel, some, some cool swag. There's also a link on there, uh, right on the landing page to the Amazon page where you can get my book honed finding your edge as a man over 40 number go. one in men's health on the Amazon bestseller list. Woo! So I'm really happy about that. Yeah. Number one. Yeah. It's well, it's number one, I think in eight categories, there's all kinds of, it got number one in ab workout, which I thought was pretty cool. And for, uh, for Did at least a while I was beating out Hicks and Gracie's book. But if I ever meet Hickson, I totally will not mention that. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, was there a big marketing push for the book? Yeah. So I did, I got a marketing package, uh, mm -hmm. with the book. So a lot of it involved getting me on podcasts, um, some Amazon ads, uh, and some other stuff. So I've done, I've been, you know, it's funny because I'll get an email from, from somebody and they'll say, uh, Hey, I just wanted to let you know that podcast episode's finally going to drop. And I got, I'm like, look at their name and I'm going, which one was this again? Like, I'm not really <laughs> sure. So, uh, it, yeah. that, that's been, that's been kind of a blur, but it's been really cool. And, I, and yeah. I've got, uh, I've got a couple of those coming up. I've got, I still have two big ones that I'm, that I'm chasing. Uh, obviously, you know, everybody wants to be on Rogan. So I'm, I'm still trying sure. to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, I had, I, I talked to Evan Hay for a little bit and he talked about having me on, but then he got busy. So uh, I'm going to circle back and talk to him about that again. Well, well I think a lot of, I think a lot of this though has to do with the specificity. That's something that we talk about with a lot of clients, which is like, you know, the more specific you are, what, because mm -hmm. people don't want to do that. Cause it's like, Oh, it'll disqualify some mm -hmm. people. And like, but you but need we, to, but we've seen that work time and time again, that if you can quickly disqualify people that don't need to see your product or learn about your product, it brings in people that do it, yeah. even well, people that don't qualify. Like, so if, uh, for example, like if my, my wife saw that. She's like, "Oh, my husband is over forty. He's kind of a loser. Like he might need this." <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so oddly enough, I've got there's a uh, um, a sixty one year old female who's a, a high level martial artist who takes my supplements. And you know, she sent me an email. She said, "I went to your website. I printed out what your ingredients were. I showed them to my doctor. I said, is there any reason I shouldn't be taking these as a woman?'" And he said, no, absolutely. You can take those. In fact, they're, they'll be highly beneficial for you. And, you know, although I, I although I centered this around uh, around male performance, there's really not going to be anything in, in any one of my supplements as they come out that no, I mean, none of it's going to be deleterious for a woman to take. So uh, and there's a lot of real beneficial that, stuff in there. That, for everybody. I just want I just want to say that's a power word and I appreciate it. Deleterious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big time vocab. Yeah. So the, the word, the, the power word that I've been using a lot in, in COVID is multivariate analysis. Oh, I, I like a little multivariate analysis. Don't know yeah. what that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Um, I really appreciate having you on. We had, this is Doc Mike Simpson. He's had every job except astronaut thus far. And uh, Graybeard Performance. Thanks so much for, ha for being on the show, man. It, it's, uh, it's been fun. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. All right. Dr. Mike Simpson. So there's a guy, Ranger. Ranger. Special Forces. 
Not a big deal. Special Forces once again, and, and as, a, oh, as a Delta. No, 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 no. Wait a second. He decides to become a medic. Yeah. He's because he wants to be on the front line because he witnessed people getting injured mm -hmm. in the, in a obviously terrible situation. Yep. He's like these guys get the most respect. Yeah. They go to the front. Yeah. They're willing to take a bullet, but they're not going to just take a bullet because I'm going to take a bullet while possibly performing some type of emergency medical procedure to save your life. Yeah. Pull your body back. Yeah. And I'm going to come back and get some more. Yeah. 18 Delta to doctor in the <laughs> ER comes back as, you know, in a forward deployed position with yeah. JSOC <laughs> and then gets out, you know, and while he's getting out, he's on TV doing a, a hit show that, that was the number one show on, was on the history. Was it that popular? Yeah. I didn't know that. Hunting Hitler was the number one show. I've never actually seen on, an episode. Now I feel the, like a kook, so I got to check it out. <laughs> number one show on the History Channel for three years. Three years? Three years running. Yeah. Oh, damn. Does the show, uh, goes into ER medicine as a civilian. Yep. Becomes the attending. But also remember, he got his idea for his business actually while as an intern because he yeah. already noticed his body was slowing down. So he's doing all of this while studying on the side, a little extra yeah. to, to, to um, figure out a way to supplement his body because he's like, I can't figure, I can, I'm losing the juice. Because right? he still wants to be an astronaut at some point, even <laughs> though he's 55, because yeah. he's not slowing down. He's got boundless energy. I think that's a thing that a lot of successful entrepreneurs have. And even though He's early on in his entrepreneurial journey. I would bet money that he's going to have at least some level of success. Yeah. Just based on the history of things. He is a continuous starter of new things. He's always on his way somewhere. Yep. And, and then the other thing we noticed is you'll see this a lot in entrepreneurs. People always think that people are doing it for the money, but he clearly is not doing it for the money. He... Yep. You know, this comes up time and time again. It's like the best entrepreneurs are like often maniacal about solving their problem. Mm -hmm. Like because I want to solve this problem for me, I will not rest. I will not stop. This is the problem I got to solve. And I mean, you could see that glowingly from him. Yeah. Like the fact, like he does not need money. He doesn't need to start Greybeard. He could have just chilled. He has his retirement from the military. He's yep. got. He's in demand. He's an ER doc. Everyone wants an ER doc. He, this, is the, this is the position people least want that are in the medicine because they yeah. don't want to be, you know, handling the bullshit. Yeah, he could, be, he could be chilling right now, doing a few shifts and, and be totally fine. Yep. But there's a problem that he wants to solve. And we say this, and every time we say it should not be purely about the money, people roll their eyes and, you know, oh, it's easy for you to say you've started these businesses. But when it's 2 a.m., when it's 3 a.m. and you're and you're filling orders because you spent, you know, you spent nine to six at your day job and, and you know, you came home, you had dinner and now you're filling the orders for the for your side God, gig that you're hoping is going to be your full time <laughs> gig someday. Yeah. If you don't love it, if you don't think it's meaningful at some point, you're just going to stop fucking doing it. That's why he's an animal, man. That's why this guy. So I don't know how successful Greybeard will become. It's obviously just started. Yep. But if you're a betting person, and we always talk about how investors bet on people. Mm. I bet on Mike. I'd bet on Mike, too. Put some money on Mike if you can. Yep. All right, guys. Uh, as always, thanks for following the Zero to Somewhere podcast. And uh, oh, you know what? What's that? The other thing that we didn't mention. What's that? He is trying to do something for the greater good. He's trying, he's trying to do something that helps people over 40 he, realize a bit of their younger selves. He mentioned directly that the only reason why he, well, not the only reason why, but one of his big motivations for writing the book was he was answering the same questions all the time from his patients. It was literally re on repeat, rinse, recycle, repeat. So he said, hey, I'm gonna take this information, package it together, produce the book. And now the supplements is all about other people wanting the same things yeah. he's got. He provide the, help, provide help the tools to solve the problem, both on the nutrition side and the information side. He's trying to do good. And people that are trying to do good tend to succeed more than people that are just trying to make money. That's my belief system. That's Albert's belief system. And uh, 
Bet on Mike Simpson. Yeah, maybe it should be our, maybe it should be our philosophy. Maybe it should be our philosophy. We only want to help. Only customers. work with businesses trying to do good. Well, we've already stated that we'll never do payday loans. By the way, the payday loan place that's down here in Durham. Yeah. I drive by a Friday night. Yeah. It's fucking packed. That's it's sad. sad. It's sad. Super sad. Anyways, that was a bit of a downer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I keep trying to finish this thing strong, but Albert keeps trying to bring us down. Finish, finish us strong, Albert. Here's your chance. Uh, I, I really enjoyed surfing today, and I'm glad I got to do this podcast with you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>